Okay, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, so I think we'll start. Okay, class. Ah, we have to cover two topics today: malaria and rickettsia. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. We'll just start with the class. Okay, so we'll start with this very important topic: malaria. Okay. So as you know that malaria is another; it's a very important uh, disease which is prevalent in India. Okay, so if you are in our country, in a country like India, you need to know about this disease. And in parasitology, this is one of the most important topics. So you need to study about it. You cannot leave this topic and go and sit for your exams. Okay, it's one of the most important topic. Parasitology, if selectively, if you have to read anything, this is the first thing you have to read. Okay. So what do you mean by the word malaria? Okay, so as I have already mentioned, ah, the it's already there on the slide. Okay, the word malaria can be split into two. Okay, mal and area. Mal means bad, something, you know, like uh, anything which is suffixed, prefixed with a mal means something bad. Mal nourished. Okay, mal nutrition, like that. No, so this mal means bad. Area means air. So this is. Uh, it was considered to be a disease which was spread by air pollution through stagnant water okay though it was a kind of a uh, in a way it was a kind of a misnomer because it didn't uh, spread through the air pollution rather it spread through the stagnation of water where the mosquitoes would breed and then and and that would be the reason for it to spread when when uh, they are the vectors and they are the ones which actually carry this parasite and then when they bite the humans then subsequently they transfer the parasite into the uh, humans okay so the person who discovered the causative agent of plasmodium is alfonso leverin okay then there is another person called sir roland uh, ross okay who described the sexual cycle of the parasite in female anopheles mosquito okay in uh, secunderabad india so you need to remember this person sir ronald ross because the sexual cycle of the parasite which was uh, it was discovered in india itself okay in secunderabad so you need to know this okay that's why this person gentleman is more important okay so alfonso leverin uh, leverin as well as sir ronald ross was given the nobel prize for his their contribution in malaria Okay, so the next is uh, you don't need to know so much. Okay, so this is the classification. It belongs to the kingdom of Protozoa. Under parasitology, the kingdom is Protozoa. Sub kingdom is Neozoa. Okay, phylum is Apicomplexa. Okay, it's called Apicomplexa because it has got some organelles which are present in the apex of its of the structure called sporozoid. Okay, it is present right in the Uh, apex. It uh, those are called apical organelles. That's why it, it belongs. It is a complex of organisms, uh, my, uh, complex of organelles which are present at the apical site. That's why they have named the term as ap complex. Okay, so the class is Coccidia. Okay, order is Hemospirida, and uh, genus is Plasmodium. Okay, so basically uh, this is always asked for you people. Name the different species of malaria. so you have to know the names of all the five species of malaria the four species of plasmodium vivax falciparum plasmodium malariae ovale these are prevalent right from before okay plasmodium nolesi is the one which has been discovered very recently okay it is basically a parasite of the monkeys but it is now known to cause even infection of the humans okay initially it was present in thailand but now even from india a few cases has been reported Okay, so just um, note all these five species and uh, remember the names. Okay, Plasmodium vivax is known to cause a benign tertian malaria. Why is it called benign? Because it is it is benign. Okay, benign means it it is does not usually does not cause very serious disease. Okay, so that's the reason why it is known as benign. Okay, then there is Plasmodium falciparum. This is the one which is responsible for causing most of the very severe malaria. Okay, so that's why it is known as malignant. You can see this word as malignant. Okay, benign is because it does not usually cause very serious disease. Malignant is because it usually causes a very severe disease. It is told tertian. Tertian means that every third day the fever occurs. Okay, so there is a gap of 48 hours. Okay, if the fever occurs today, then I will not have any fever for 24, 48 hours. And on the third day, tomorrow day after tomorrow, no fever. On the third day, then there will be fever. 
Okay, so that's why it's called tertian. So the periodicity of fever is once in 48 hours. So same here, falciparum malignant because it is known to cause very severe disease and complicated malaria usually occurs due to this plasmodium falciparum. Okay, so you need to know this, uh, these other terms also, benign tertian malaria, malignant tertian malaria, uh, because these are asked sometimes in the MCQs. And even if you ask the name of the species, if you mention all this, these are some extra points for the people who are mentioning it. Okay, so ben uh, then there is plasmodium malaria. Okay, they are known to cause benign quartan malaria. Okay, now why is it called quartan? Quartan because every fourth day, so after the three days period, the fever recurs. Okay, so that is on the fourth day, the fever always occurs and again benign because usually it does not cause very severe disease. Okay, then there is something called plasmodium oval which causes oval tertian malaria. Okay, so again tertian is again every 40, every third day the fever occurs. Okay, so the most new parasite which is new species of the parasite which has been discovered fairly recently maybe in the year I think 2015 if I am not mistaken. 2014-15 I think this was the one which was given uh, which was uh, came to light that it causes infection in humans also. So it causes cotidian means every 24 hours this fever uh, can occur almost every day. So every every day the fever can recur. Okay so that's why it is known as cotidian. Okay so it is uh, basically as I told you the parasite of the monkeys is known to cause infection in humans very recently. Okay so the life cycle of the malarial parasite is basically it has got two stages of life cycle okay in parasitology you'll always come across this term as in definite host intermediate host okay definite host are the host where the sexual cycle of the parasite occurs so in this case in malaria the sexual cycle of the parasite it occurs on the in the mosquitoes okay so they are the vectors they are the one who actually harbor the infection and propagate the infection because the sexual cycle takes place in them the asexual cycle will not take place in the mosquito okay and which uh, species of the mosquito which genus of the mosquito the main genus of the mos the genus of the mosquito which is responsible for transmitting infection in humans is female anopheles mosquito okay you can see the word female right which means they have mentioned specifically female so this means that uh, the, the male anopheles mosquito will is not the one which will be transmitting the infection to humans why is that because the male anopheles mosquitoes they do not bite the humans they only feed on the fruit juices okay so they don't have a tendency to bite the humans whereas female anopheles mosquito because they are females they need the blood meal for their ovum to develop okay for the eggs of eggs to be developed so that is the reason that is the reason why this female anopheles mosquito uh, is the one who feeds on the human they bite the humans and on the event of biting they actually transmit the infection to the uh, to the humans okay so that's why okay, you're here you're listening to me no yes sir yes so wh what is the vector you tell me which is the vector for transmitting and uh, this uh, uh, malaria infection into humans Sir, female anopheles. Yes, female anopheles mosquito. Okay, so please remember. Okay, there are many species of anopheles which is responsible. One of them is anopheles fluvialis, which is the main um, species of anopheles mosquitoes which is present in the hills. Then there is anopheles tifensi, which is responsible for transmitting malaria in urban areas. Then there is anopheles um, your uh, culici facies. Okay, they are responsible for transmitting the infection in the rural areas. So please remember this because vectors are very important. Okay, slowly when as we move uh, to the next classes, you will see that other kind of uh, vectors are there which are responsible for transmitting other parasites. Okay, so for malaria, you cannot afford to miss out because they ask you, it will be a very objective question, name the vector. So you just have to name this, you will get one mark. Okay, so please remember this, don't forget. So definitive host is, we tell it is a definitive host whenever there is a transmission of, when, whenever the sexual cycle, if it occurs in the host, then it is called a definitive host. If a asexual cycle occurs, then it is known as the intermediate host. So humans are the intermediate host. Okay, so because the asexual cycle takes place here. So the, the human cycle now, they has three phases. Okay, the one is the pre-erythrocytic. Pre-erythrocytic, as the name suggests, 
before the it enters the rbc there is it undergoes multiplication elsewhere before it enters the rbc that is basically the liver so it is also known as the tissue stage of the infection or pre erythrocytic stage okay then after that from the liver that initial development occurs and then after that it would be released into the blood stream and from the blood stream it will infect the rbcs and then it will stay inside the rbcs there it will multiply finally releasing many merozoites and those merozoites will be able to cause new infections i mean will it be able to cause uh, cause infection of the new rbcs okay so then the gametogony occurs okay so that gametogony is a kind of a exoerythrocytic phase okay because it occurs outside the rbc so this is the life cycle in a nutshell okay so whenever a mosquito bites a human okay what do a mosquito does is in the event of uh, taking a blood meal it kind of regurgitates from its salivary gland the saliva which is replete with sporozoites because these sporozoites are actually basically stored in the salivary gland okay so when the mosquito bites okay that time it regurgitates all the along with the saliva the sporozoites is inoculated into the humans okay so from the once it's inoculated into the human it goes to the liver okay so as you can see this sporozoites is taken into the liver the liver has certain kind of specialized receptors are there in the liver which is known as this circum in this sporozoite there are certain proteins which are known as the circum sporozoite protein okay and there is some thrombospondin receptors which is present on the basal lateral surface of the hepatocytes from the those receptors they bind to this circum sporozoite proteins of this sporozoites and the sporozoites are taken inside so you can see there you can see this sporozoid it has been taken inside the liver then from here the sporozoites they transform into a trophozoid you can see the trophozoite there is a nucleus right here this is the cytoplasm okay and this is outside this is the hepatocyte so inside one of the hepatocytic cells this development is occurring now there is by method of meiosis this cell division parasite will begin to divide and then this will this will result in the form, formation of many small parasites which are inside which is known as the pre erythrocytic schizonts okay schizony is basically the asexual a uh, cycle of multiplication okay by meiosis it will divide into many you can see here so this will further develop and it will result in the formation of hepatic merozoites now this cell will finally rupture once it ruptures this merozoites will be released which will be picked up by the blood okay and then in the blood what happen this merozoites is going to bind to the glycophorin receptors which are present on the surface of the rbcs there are certain receptors called the glycophorin receptors which is present on the surface of the rbcs which is known to bind to this hepatic merozoites so these merozoites the moment it binds to the rbc uh, it binds to the surface of the rbc it is internalized immediately by the process of endocytosis once it is internalized uh, internalized you can see here okay this hepatic merozoites inside the rbc it begins to develop and the first form which you can see for these parasites most of the parasites are the ring form okay that is the early trophozoitic form early trophozoitic form is known as the ring form you can see that the structure of the parasite is in the form of a ring can you make out yes sir okay can you see uh, yes, when sir. i am moving the uh, my cursor you can follow that no yes sir okay. yes sir so this is the thing it looks in the form of a ring it's also known as a signet ring okay signet ring means like a like a ring you know engagement ring okay so this is kind of a engagement ring which is uh, i mean any kind of a ring which you can put in a finger that's why it's called the ring form okay then after that they come to the late trophozoitic form late trophozoitic form you can see that it is more amoeboidic okay so now you just have to concentrate here see in the ring form no there is something called red color dot you can see here can you see the red color dot yes sir okay yes, sir. this red color dot is a nucleus okay and this blue color ring which you are noticing here okay this blue color ring is basically the cytoplasm okay so this is the cytoplasm okay and this is uh, this red color is your nucleus okay now this one when it further develops it will become trophozoitic out here uh, it will become this is known as a late trophozoite it will become more amoeboidic as you can see in this picture and then from here again meiosis will occur and asexually it will divide into many forms of schizonts see 
immature schizons are there which will further mature okay this will be a mature for schizons and then finally it will turn into a merozoid and the merozoid will be released you can see this erythrocytic merozoid there was hepatic merozoids here this is called because it is occurring inside the rbc so it is known as the erythrocytic merozoids so once it skips multiplying the rbc will not be able to contain it it will rupture and then as a result of this rupturing this merozoids will be released and this merozoids can now you know infect the new rbcs or it would develop further and it will form into gametes you can see this gametes male and female gamete male and female gametes this is male and female gamete this banana shaped gametes which you can see of both okay these are of the gametocytes of the plasmodium falciparum circular gametes which you are seeing these are gametocytes of the plasmodium vivax ovale and malaria okay so this undergoes this so you got this okay these gametocytes are there so this is the male and the female gametocytes so what will happen is these male and female gametocytes they are not going to fertilize or they are not going to combine here okay when the mosquito comes and feeds on to the humans okay what will happen is that from the humans it may take any of these forms any of these forms here any of these forms which are there exoerythrocytic phase also this gametocytes can be taken into the mosquito okay so once it is transmitted into the mosquito the asexual forms if it is taken that is digested into the mosquito it does not develop further but if the gametocytes goes into the mosquito what happens is they would fertilize okay the female gametes will further ex flagellation will occur it will result in the formation of these micro gametes okay and the macro gametes nothing happens it does not divide further it only matures further it will form a mature gametocyte so this single macro gamete is going to after ex flagellation it will going to one of these uh developed micro gametes is going to they are going to fertilize okay and after fertilization it will form a oo o type cells okay oo kinetic cells and then after that this oo kinetic cells this will invade the gut mucosa of the mosquito and will remain just below the basolateral membrane it resulting in the formation of oo cysts okay so these oo cysts will mature further okay this mature cysts and then finally sporozoites will be formed you can see here sporozoites huh? inside this mature oo cyst sporozoites are formed this will rupture the sporozoites will be taken this all occurs in the mid gut okay so, so from here this sporozoites finally it enters into the salivary gland and it gets stored there uh, getting ready to bite any humans again and then it will regurgitate the saliva along with the saliva the sporozoites will be inoculated into the humans and then the cycle will continue it's clear no life cycle yes sir yes sir okay and you can see the picture of this female anopheles mosquito can you see it properly here okay so please yes sir So remember okay so there are different species of anopheles even if you don't remember it's fine but anopheles you cannot afford to forget okay so what do you mean by a definitive host what do you mean by a definitive host what happens to a definitive host what is a definitive host what is a intermediate host i kept stressing in my earlier slide anyone so definitive host is uh, definitive host. Host cycle and intermediate host is take place through asexual cycle yes okay so remember this okay please don't uh, forget this you remember and please concentrate in the class because i am just speaking something and then you will are forgetting the next moment okay so now coming to this another term there is something called relapse and there is something called recrudescence okay so basically both of them is it's uh, maybe sometimes people use it interchangeably but they are very much different okay the only common thing is this is kind of a it it gives a picture of a re reinfection kind of phase okay though it is not a reinfection it is the original infection which has occurred and but it manifests differently okay so i'll just tell you and this picture, this question also comes okay what do you mean by relapse what do you mean by recrudescence so what is the difference between relapse and recrudescence so this question is asked okay they'll ask you the they might ask you the life cycle of the malarial parasite they might ask you what is the vector they'll ask you what are the different species of malaria and they this is another favorite question which they might ask you is a relapse and recrudescence so what do you mean by relapse relapse is basically seen in plasmodium vivax and plasmodium ovale okay in this what happens as i told you in the previous slide no there is this erythro pre erythrocytic schizony is occurring no here okay in the humans once these sporozoites enter they enter the liver in the hepatic cells hepatocytes so in the hepatocytes these sporozoites are taken and then they start developing out here trophozoite and then 
schizonia occurs and forms free erythrocytic, erythrocytic schizons and hepatic merozoids forms okay so in this hepatic merozoids what happened now some of these hepatocytes in merozoids instead of multiplying it will remain dormant in that for a long long period okay for a few years you can see for 3 weeks to 1 year okay these few sporozoids do not develop okay so these sporozoids which are there now it do not develop further instead of it's not maturing into trophozoite into schizons and into merozoites rather it is some of them not all there will be so many liver cells which will be affected okay one or few of the liver cells might not develop further the sporozoites in them will not develop further will remain dormant okay the hepatocytes will be viable and the sporozoites inside will just remain dormant okay so they remain dormant for a period of any 3 weeks to 1 year so what happens is that later after this period maybe it will just get reactivated suddenly okay if it gets reactivated it will start developing further and then the cycle will be propagated further okay clear so that is called a relapse okay some of the sporozoites they remain dormant in the hepatic cells i'll be asking you okay please please concentrate so some of the sporozoites are going to after infecting the hepatocytes they are going to remain dormant okay and they will not develop further but after certain period of time from 3 week to 1 year they would suddenly they are known as hypnozoites when they are dormant okay but they will suddenly start uh, developing further and then once it starts developing further then this um, the, then there, there is a relapse of malaria okay now what is how is it different from recrudescence recrudescence basically is uh it's 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 kind of an original infection okay which in which the person has become asymptomatic if you do some kind of uh, the various laboratory test if you do to detect uh, malaria it comes out to be negative however the patient is not completely cured of the infection the infection still harbors in, in the humans but at a low undetectable level it is so low that it cannot be detected okay because for any kind of test to be you know uh, come out to to for it to come out to be positive if there has to be a certain minimum amount of those microorganism bacteria fungi or whatever it is even parasites certain minimum level threshold level has to be there where the test is capable of detecting it okay but if it is much below that level then what happens is uh, i mean it just remains there so this may continue for a long long period of time until the person's immunity wanes off okay maybe in the old days that's why you can see like recrudescence can may last up to 60 years okay so what happens because because it would just remain there and the immunity when it goes down then suddenly it will get again you know it will uh, uh, that is the time when it will start manifesting itself so this is also looks like a kind of a reinfection but it is not a reinfection why does it occur it is usually occurs for people you know who are uh, treated with drugs okay see recrudescence is due to the persistence of drug resistant parasites even after the completion of treatment okay so you got it now what is the difference relapse and recrudescence okay and then the species which are showing is also different recrudescence is only exhibited by plasmodium falciparum and malaria whereas relapse is uh, shown by plasmodium vivax and ovil okay yes sir yes sir okay so this is very yes, important slide don't forget to read this now coming to benign malaria okay so every malaria basically the stages the fever which occurs no that actually coincides with this stage of the cycle can you see here this merozoi uh, mature schizons are there then the merozoites which are this rbc when it ruptures and releases a lot of merozoites this is the time you can see here no this is the time when the fever occurs mostly okay so this is a time when a very high grade fever will occur so basically you have three stages paroxysm paroxysm of fever is comprised of three stages that is the cold stage hot stage and sweating stage your cold stage is the first stage okay in this the patient is you know uh, that time the patient suddenly becomes very cold you know there is a lot of lassitude slight headache will be there and this will be followed by the rise in temperature when the temperature goes to around 99 sorry 100 101 degree temperature will occur in which the, there will be a lot of flushing sweating will be there temperature will be very high okay this is followed by the sudden fall in the temperature which is the sweating stage so these three stages of thing occurs and usually this it follows a kind of a cycle as i told you know those benign benign uh, tertian malaria matlab every third day 
every third day there will be a temperature will be there every fourth day temperature will be there in case of plasmodium malaria okay that is called the cotton malaria okay so it depends on the stages of thing and sometimes there may be a continuous fever why there will be a continuous fever because the reason for that is that different rbcs are at different stages of the development of the parasite okay one of the rbcs may be releasing the merozoites while the another section of the rbcs might be just taking in the sporozoites so every now and then you know some uh, some uh, parasites the schizons have matured and formed into merozoites and the rbc is rupturing and releasing it so in many cases you see a kind of a continuous kind of fever so okay this uh, paroxysm of fever may not be followed in every case okay however a classical case will represent like this okay so then there is anemia is then why the anemia is there because as you all know that once rbc is infected there is lysis of the rbc because the merozoites are released by lysis of the rbc because the rbc cannot contain that ever developing uh, merozoites which are there okay at a certain point of time it will give way and will rupture so because of the parasite induced destruction of the rbc anemia may happen and because it is a parasitized rbc so it acts as a foreign body now which is removed by the spleen okay so the spleen is known to remove all the infected rbcs as well as uninfected rbcs which are coated by the immune complexes okay that is a function of the spleen okay then the parasite may directly suppress the bone marrow okay so it will lead to de de reduced production of the rbcs and the rbcs which are infect infected becomes more fragile so that is why again there will be reduction in the number of rbcs and autoimmune lysis of the coated rbcs also occur this all are reasons for anemia splenomegaly may occur because obviously a spleen is working overnight for clearing the infection from the blood okay so it is trying to destroy the rbc so anything it's like gymming no when you try to build up your biceps if you do more pressure on your uh, biceps then your biceps will start to bulge so similarly spleen also it is doing so much of work then slowly your spleen will begin to get uh, okay so it will get enlarged because it has to do a lot of work and it will be palpable these are very tell tell sign of malaria okay fever anemia splenomegaly these are like classical triads okay so now coming to the malignant tertian malaria this is as i told you malignant plasmodium falciparum is known to cause a known to cause a very severe infection okay so this is the one which causes very severe infection ah so uh, please remember this that's why it is called as malignant why does it cause a serious infection because one reason is that plasmodium falciparum can affect all stages of rbc right from the immature to the most mature phases okay so almost all rbcs in every age group is infected so a large number of rbcs can be infected you can see there is a high level of parasitemia which is can be seen around 32% 30 to 40% of the total rbcs of a human which means a lot is infected so if you have a such a high degree of parasitemia definitely you are going to have very difficult the response is going i mean the severity of the disease will be more because there will be more destruction of the rbcs there will be more clogging of the rbcs so these things are there your spleen will also be working overnight you'll have a huge splenomegaly which will be right down almost touching going across the umbilicus also okay so these things are very much thing and another thing is that in plasmodium falciparum there are it has got the ability to sequester the parasites in the blood vessels in the deep visceral organs so the capillaries which are present in the organs like brain your liver your spleen your internal organs maybe your even your uh, kidneys all your visceral organs in the capillaries it has got the ability it can go there because it has got so one very important protein which is known as the plasmodium falciparum erythrocyte membrane protein this protein is very important this protein which is exhibited by plasmodium falciparum is known to bind to the endothelial cells and these endothelial cells are present in the blood vessels mainly in the capillaries that's why these proteins which are present in plasmodium falciparum through this protein they bind to the endothelial cells once they bind to the endothelial cells this is called cytoadherence so it remains sequestered there okay and these proteins can also bind to the uninfected rbcs also okay so that is called rosating so it has got you know two way thing once it will bind to the endothelial cells and from the other side it can bind to the uninfected rbcs also so this will result in the clogging of those vessels in the internal organs 
as a result they can be they can be a little decrease in the blood supply because it is causing clogging there okay so this will lead to ischemia and necrosis and then other uh, um, uh, your uh, your shock hypotension septicemia these things can set in later okay so those are the complications of malaria that's why plasmodium falciparum is known to cause complicated malaria while other parasites other species of this malarial parasite like plasmodium vivax and ovel and malaria are le causes less disease causes a disease but of lesser severity okay so parasitized rbc become more spherical and rigid so all these things are there and another important property of this plasmodium falciparum okay this erythrocyte membrane protein is that it undergoes antigenic variation which means the the antigenicity part of it continuously it keeps changing it keeps evolving so once an antibody is developed against it which would help in clearing the parasite but what happens is they, they are very smart they may undergo frequent and anti antigenic variation whenever it is under the pressure of the antibodies and then it will change its structure just like covid we are seeing it no new strain after new strain alpha beta delta gamma strain so many because it is undergoing mutation because of the pressure to survive in the human body okay because the antibodies are developing to clear it so they are trying to survive and then it undergoes mutation so this plasmodium falciparum erythrocyte membrane protein is known to cause this frequent antigenic variation which helps the parasite in evading the host immune response okay so the complications of this is that it may cause cerebral malaria as i told you because of these features of cyto adherence you can see this cyto adherence rosetting these are the features because of the presence of this plasmodium falciparum erythrocyte membrane protein it can cause clogging of the vessels and this will lead to your uh, symptoms of if it occurs in the brain capillaries then it will give you give rise to all kinds of cns symptoms like symmetric encephalopathy characterized by generalized convulsion in 10% of the adults and up to 50% of the children muscle tone tendon reflexes are really used retinal hemorrhage may occur neurologic sequelae repeated seizures Uh, rarely deep coma can occur signs of focal neurological and meningeal irritations are absent high mortality rate so these are the things okay so now because of this uh, rosetting and uh, sequestration which occurs all the forms of the plasmodium falciparum will may not be found in the peripheral blood smear it is only the early trophozoic form which is present in the peripheral blood smear whereas the later forms are not present okay so other things like pernicious anemia may occur which means characterized by black water fever okay black water fever algid malaria and septicemic malaria these three triad these are known as pernicious malaria what do you mean by black water fever is the sudden because there will be a large scale destruction of the rbcs lot of hemoglobin will be released these hemoglobin will be passed in the urine which is responsible for causing hemoglobinuria and this hemoglobin when it is released outside when it comes in contact with the atmospheric oxygen then it will get oxidized and that is responsible for causing dark colored urine so there is a triad of fever hemoglobinuria and dark urine okay it mainly occurs in case of whenever following quinine treatment okay because lot of see plasmodium falciparum you have started anti malarial parasite there are lot of parasites a lot of the rbcs which are infected by this plasmodium falciparum now once you start these anti malarial drugs like quinine it will cause destruction of the rbcs okay so that will in a way be responsible for causing this black water fever okay so and antibodies begin to develop against this parasitized and quinonized rbcs these antibodies will cause large scale destruction of the rbcs resulting in this phenomenon algid malaria is nothing it is kind of a septicemic shock which will occur cold clammy skin hypotension peripheral circulatory frame profound shock okay septicemic malaria again this high degree of prostration high degree of fever dissemination of the parasites to various organs all these things will occur so triad of all these three together is known as pernicious malaria okay this may also result in pulmonary edema and adult respiratory distress syndrome hypoglycemia may occur okay where the sugar level is less than 45 mg per deciliter renal failure may occur okay this is basically mostly seen in plasmodium malaria cases also okay in renal failure because immune complexes they go and bind to the glomerulus and then it may cause some kind of nephropathy there bleeding and disseminated intravascular coagulation can occur because of the widespread uh, uh, affection of this rbcs and then sequestration okay so because of that then severe jaundice then this anemia which is non monochromic non monocytic all these things are there acidosis also may occur due to accumulation as i told you it may lead to ischemia which may cause you know accumulation of this lactic acid okay so 
then there are chronic complications of malaria when we come across these chronic complications there is something called tropical splenomegaly which develops in people who reside in the endemic areas okay then there is cotton this occurs because of the elevated polyclonal b cell activation and which results in the elevated igm levels okay there will be massive splenomegaly hepatic sinusoidal lymphocytosis will be there okay peripheral b cell lymphocytosis may occur then cotton malarial nephropathy may occur this is another chronic complication which is usually seen in patient with plasmodium malaria because it occurs due to injury injury of the renal glomeruli by the immune complexes which results in nephrotic syndrome it may also promote burkitt's lymphoma in african children okay so their immunity is that there are certain category of people okay who may be slightly more protected against malaria infection than others okay that may be it also see, depends on the age of the rbcs plasmodium falciparum they are known to attack rbcs of any age so that's why a large number of rbcs are affected at once whereas plasmodium vivax and ovel they attack only the young rbcs okay like reticulocytes whereas malaria they are known to attack the older rbcs so depends on that the severity of the disease will will vary Not, also the on based on nature of the hemoglobin certain kind of protection can be there like sick patient with sickle cell disease hemoglobin c and e fetal hemoglobin and thalassemia hemoglobin are resistant to plasmodium falciparum infection why because the oxygen tension there is less and the parasites will not be able to survive there that's why even this hereditary ovulocytosis here the rigid rbcs are resistant to plasmodium falciparum infection okay so these are certain duffy negative rbcs patients with this duffy negative rbcs they are kind of more protected they are not prone to develop they are they do not have the receptors to take in the parasites immediately so they are also protected okay then uh, people with glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency they are also kind of protected nutritional status it has a paradoxical effect severe malaria is rare in children suffering from this is one of the things it has got a paradoxical effect because what we consider is that if your nutrition status is bad then the infection will be your immunity will be low and then infection will be more severe but here it is paradoxical yeah if your immunity is low there will be less chances that you will develop a very severe malaria because the in this case even the immunity that widespread destruction which occurs and the anemia which sets in those things are also those things are mainly responsible for causing the severe disease okay so acquired immunity you can just small you can just have a read on it okay immediate immunity means there are antibodies which are developed circulating antibodies like iga is there igm igg which against the asexual form which gives protection by inhibiting the red cell invasion and sequestration okay then cellular immunity also is there okay the cytokines released from the t cells stimulate the macrophages and also stimulate the b cells to produce the antibodies okay the and immunity lasts only till the time the original infection is there so this is this is known as the premonition or infection immunity okay so this is basically the burden of the infection in india you can see plasmodium falciparum the most states common state which is affected is odisha which is the maximum affected by malaria followed by chatisgarh and jharkhand okay and all of the parasites species of the parasites are seen in odisha okay it gives plasmodium falciparum vivax malaria all of these are present malaria is very less less than 1% and reported from karnataka ovel is also confined mainly to tropical africa only few cases are reported from india such as odisha okay so just know this now laboratory diagnosis as we all know is the peripheral blood smear we can make a thick and the thin smear okay that is the way to see in that you will have to see the forms of the parasite which i'll just show you in my next picture okay the non microscopic test like antigen detection detection test culture molecular diagnosis these are another culture can also be done the media for this is rosewell parker memorial institute 1640 media this is the media which is used for the culture of the parasite but it is very tedious not used for diagnostic purpose it is only used for development of malarial antigens okay or for your uh, epidemiological purpose or uh, for uh, not exactly epidemiological for research purpose only culture is done because it is very difficult to propagate to culture of malarial parasite so specimen is basically the peripheral blood is collected from either the yellow or finger prick or grade 2 in case of infants time for taking the blood is usually collected few years after the height of paroxysm of fever and before taking anti malarial drugs frequency smear should be examined at least twice daily until parasites are detected types of peripheral blood smear is you should make a thin and a thick smear the advantage of a thin smear is that you can speciate the malarial parasite speciation is speciation speciation is also important because if it is plasmodium falciparum then it is a, got a propensity to cause severe malaria so the, then 
severe and complicated malaria so you will be more on a look out for this kind of a species where you will have to be on look out for all kind of uh, complication which may arise okay so that's why uh, speciation is important another thing is that the burden of the parasite will also will know okay so how much of response to the treatment is there we will once we start the treatment we can you know monitor the patients by taking follow up peripheral blood smear thin and thick smear and we can see the load of the parasites okay smears are stained with one of these stains romanowski stains leishman and jimson stain the thin smear okay so these things are there you just see okay so advantage i have told you okay and what is the advantage of the thick smear is that in thick smear because the amount of blood is much more there okay the area to be absorbed is less okay so what happens is that it is 40 times more sensitive as compared to the your uh, thin smear so sensitivity is more however for speciation only thin smear is the one which can be done okay where th th i mean for you cannot speciate in a thick smear because the rbc is completely lysed it's only the parasites which stay there okay so this is the picture you can see okay plasmodium vivax is here falciparum malaria oval so okay you can see the size of the rbc in the vivax and oval is slightly more okay oval it is called because the size of the because the shape of the rbc is slightly oval okay then there is falciparum and malaria the size of the rbc is normal it is not enlarged okay it is normocytic okay here it is macrocytic vivax and oval okay the early ring forms is almost similar in all except for falciparum where the size of the ring is smaller and multiple ring forms can be seen okay whereas in this vivax the ring forms are slightly bigger so you can see this red one is the nucleus this is the cytoplasm and this is the vacuole inside food vacuole you call it the hemoglobin which is there the parasite feeds on those hemoglobin okay once it feeds on the hemoglobin the undigested part of this hemoglobin the protein part of the hemoglobin and the iron porphyrins these accumulate in the form of malarial pigments these are the pigments you can see see you can see this one no malarial pigment striplings which are there this is called the malarial pigment okay on the late trophozoic form you can see that it is become more amoeboidic okay whereas in falciparum also it is become slightly amoeboidic and then malaria the late trophozoic form is the one which is the diagnostic for malaria because it is band form okay and the nucleus is eccentric but it is diffuse you can see this no red color is a nucleus blue color is a cytoplasm okay and there is no food vacuole there okay so this is the thing and mali and oval you can see that there is a fimbriated rbcs are there but in the there is not much of a difference in the ring forms of it okay so shizens also almost similar for all of them okay so the only in gametocytes of vivax malaria oval they are almost similar except for oval you can see that rbc is fimbriated okay but apart from that they are similar in the form of gametocytes whereas in falciparum you can see it is banana shaped the female gametocytes are more deeply blue stained the nucleus is more compact okay and the rounds and the edges are pointed whereas the male gametocytes the round the edges are it is rounded and the and the cytoplasm is stained pale blue okay and the nucleus is very diffuse here okay so these are the parasites you can see see this is the ring form you can make out plasmodium vivax ring form this is the amoeboid form you can see of the parasite and these are the malarial pigments also which is present here you can make out there these are the malarial pigments okay this is the schizons okay which is present you can make out the schizon okay then the gametocytes okay this is the female gametocyte okay you can see this ha ah, see this is multiple ring forms you can see this is plasmodium falciparum you can make out now you can see the pictures yes sir okay yes see, sir see, this is the multiple ring forms which you can see see this is a enlarged view okay this is the red color nucleus this is the blue color cytoplasm this is the food vacuole this is the acol form okay which is present when the nucleus is present right at the edge of the rbc it is known as the acol form which is pathognomonic of plasmodium falciparum and here you can see can you see the gametocyte this is more rounded nucleus is more diffuse okay so these things are there these are the ring forms again this is for falciparum here also falciparum you can see make out okay so this is the female gametocyte this is the male gametocyte okay 
so this see this is you can see the fimbriated uh, rbcs fimbriated rbcs was present in plasmodium fimbriated rbcs is present in which one which plasmodium species c and l ovale okay so ring forms of ovale see now this you can see the fimbriated rbcs no here see see these can make out yes sir okay so this is the band forms which are seen okay so so then coming to quantitative blood Uh, QBC, which is also known as the quantitative Buffy coat examination. Okay, this is more sensitive to the peripheral blood smear examination because the stain which we are using is acridine or orange stain. It is, however, you need an source of ultraviolet light to examine this. So, what happens is acridine or orange stain basically it stains the nucleus, uh, nuclear DNA as fluorescent brilliant green. It is seen as a fluorescent brilliant green. Okay, whereas the normal RBCs they do do not take up the stain because they are enucleated. All the normal RBCs, the mature RBCs, do not have nucleus. It is the immature RBCs which has the nucleus like reticulocytes. Whereas the normal RBCs do not have. So the RBCs which is circulating in our blood do not have any nucleus. Okay, so if in case it takes up this, you know, DNA that fluorescent brilliant green, that is because inside the RBCs, if you can see the stain, that means it is because of the parasite because parasite is got a nuclear component to it. that is why okay so that's why it is a little more sensitive however the disadvantage is first of all you need a source of ultraviolet light which means and uh, you need a kind of a fluorescent microscope okay which is expensive another thing is that a lot of artifacts can be seen okay so parasitized rbcs can be seen as brilliant green dots wbcs also take up the stain because they have the nucleus okay so it will bind to the dna in the nuclear thing so that's why there's a lot of artifacts in this okay so it is much faster more sensitive and quantification is thing okay so this is kind of a thing you can see this no you can see this brilliant green dot brilliant green dot these are all parasitized rbcs okay so you can see later okay antigen detection they are something called plasmo plasmodium lactase dehydrogenase enzyme okay then aldolase enzyme okay so lactase dehydrogenase is present in all the plasmodium species so if it is positive then we know that it is basically it is any of the plasmodium species aldolase also if it is come out to be positive then it can be any of the plasmodium species but there is something called plasmodium falciparum specific histidine rich protein 2 so this is the protein which is specific to plasmodium falciparum so we can identify plasmodium falciparum by testing for this antigen okay these are all immunochromatography test which can be done okay these are those ict test immunochromatographic test which is done okay by lateral flow assay no you just have to put the drop of the serum there and then by uh, color band no these bands we can make out so you can see this is the control body this is kind of negative okay this one is the lactase dehydrogenase which if it comes positive it can be any of the plasmodium species and this is the histidine rich protein it is negative here so it is we know that it is not falciparum it may be either vivex or ovule or malaria and this one is come out to be positive which means that it is this is plasmodium infection and in plasmodium it is caused by plasmodium falciparum infection because this histidine rich protein 2 band is also coming out to be positive okay so you please just read go through all this culture as i told you only rp mi just need know the name of the media we don't need to know more molecular test can be done here okay the advantage of it is that it can detection limit is 10 to 100 copies per microliter if so less burden of the parasite is also there then it can detect okay certain parasites like nolisi and all is easier to detect like this okay so these things are there please just go ahead okay the the uh, drugs used for the treatment is in the northeastern states okay it is used is artemis artemis uh, artemisinin uh, combination therapy is used okay where artemithar and lumefantrine is combined and it is given okay along with primaquine okay then there is this uh, for the other states what we are using is sulfadoxin plus pyrimethamine Okay, so I have all uh, mentioned here pyrimethamin and sulfadoxin, all these things. You just know the name of the drugs. It's not uh, like at least the names you should know, even if you do not know the doses. Okay, and what are the drugs used for prophylaxis? Okay, if you are going to a malaria endemic region, if it's less than six weeks, then it is you can give doxycycline. If it is more than six weeks, then you have to give mefloquine. Okay, so we'll just go through rickettsia. Okay. this will be a little short one because this is also important for you okay you are still with me no yes, yes sir. sir yes sir okay yes sir okay so 
Rickettsia is basically a gram negative coccobacilli it is non motile it is an obligate intracellular organism this word is very important obligate means it cannot survive outside the cells it has it needs your cell to survive it's, it's got a lot of similarity with the virus in fact initially rickettsia was considered a virus only later it was proven to be otherwise because it was found that rickettsia has got a cell wall which is similar to that of the gram negative organism it has got a lipopolysaccharide layer it has got the outer membrane proteins okay it has got those endotoxic active endotoxin activities okay so these things were there plus it uh, it did not pass through a bacterial filter okay and plus it has got dna as well as rna it has got ribosomes which is responsible for production of uh, protein it has got the enzymes which are responsible for uh, taking uh, uh, undergoing those glycolytic pathway so these are all characteristics of bacteria okay so the only thing which was matching with the dr virus category was that it is obligate intracellular it was unable to grow in artificial media like viruses they are unable to grow in artificial media or like a blood agar or meconkey virus will never grow it needs a cell line similarly this one also needs a cell line to grow it or it needs an inoculation of the animal or the eggs for it to eggs to, it has to be inoculated for it to grow it will not grow if you just inoculate your blood agar and meconkey or nutrient agar or any of those artificial medias which are there because it is it needs a cell cellular structure for it to grow it cannot grow outside the cells okay so that is one of thing which is common with the virus but i told you so many other reasons why it was again put into the under the bacteria okay so it can grow in cell lines animal egg inoculation transmitted by the arthropod vectors like tick mite and flea louse okay so basically this family of rickettsia c consists of rickettsia and orientia okay rickettsia is responsible for causing epidemic typhus endemic typhus okay that is the typhus group of fever then there is a spotty uh spotty fever group which there which is caused by uh, which is uh, uh, the disease under is uh, under it is the rickettsia mountain uh, rocky mountain spotted fever then you have indian tick typhus okay then there is there is african tick fever virus okay so many things are there i we have a chart for this i'll just show you okay why it's a bacteria as i, I already told you yeah another thing is that it divides by binary fission all bacteria divided by binary fission no? from 1 to 2 2 to 4 4 to 8 like that so this is also there and it is susceptible to antimicrobial agents also and is also able to see under the light microscope okay so now this table is very important you can see ha huh? see typhus group is basically has two species one is rickettsia provoseki rickettsia typhi rickettsia provoseki is known to cause epidemic typhus or if it goes into recrudescence we we read about the term recrudescence earlier in malaria no recrudescence infection which is already yes, there sir. yes okay so in this case also if it becomes no once this is kind of treated and but it is not completely gone from the human body it remains in a dormant state okay at a very low undetectable level in the humans okay in the cellular structures okay only later in the life when the immunity of the person goes down when the with age when the immunity goes down suddenly this disease again reappears so this one this disease which was is caused by rickettsia provoseki in that case is known as brill jenser disease so it is kind of a epidemic typhus which has been cured which seems to be cured but only to reappear later at your old age or when if you suffer from any immunosuppressive condition it may just occur okay so the vector for it is louse okay so you if you know this chart no a lot of things will be clear so please know it okay where it is distributed it is given here rickettsia typhi it's caused endemic typhus and flea is the one which is the one which is the vector so louse what do you mean by louse do we have louse or not human body where do we have the louse what do you mean by louse ectoparasite sir yes sorry ecto ectoparasite very good what is the uh, common word which we use Uh, the females are very much uh, you know they would be knowing it or doing this regularly somewhere maybe at home or i don't know even maybe in the hostel also where do you find this louse most commonly in the human body tell me hurry up hair sir hair okay lice okay we call no lice louse is a singular term lice is a plural term okay so endemic typhus is caused by flea and louse and flea they usually flea sometimes they might bite also but louse usually do not it does not bite what happens is that when we try to scratch 
okay when uh, any abraded skin is there or the mucosa where the these louse have deposited the feces and we tend to scratch because they are irritants and then we will auto inoculate into our body so that is the way this this is transmitted flea sometimes may bite but mostly it is again by the by the uh, thing of the uh, uh by the excreta of the louse and the flea okay the feces which they pass no if that is rubbed into a into a abraded skin or the mucosa then it will the infection will be transmitted now coming to this spotted fever group there is a rickettsia 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 conodi rickettsia is known to cause rocky mountain spotted fever group this is the species of rickettsia which is the most pathogenic and most severe infection the mortality is very high in this rickettsia even this conodi which is known as indian tick typhus because it is present in india even here it is almost like rocky mountain spotted fever group and the mortality is also very high however this rms is known to cause more severe disease okay then rickettsia africa and acari they are less severe okay they cause less severe disease and these are all transmitted by tick except for rickettsia pox which is transmitted by mite okay so now this africa and acari the lesions which they produce now all of this rickettsia infection is basically it causes fever okay then it causes kind of uh, your uh, rashes in your human body okay so that is why it is known as a spotted fever group okay because you will have a lot of maculopapular rash which may be a hemorrhagic rash also okay in africa and acari you see a basically a vesicular rash that's why this rickettsia acari is known as disease known as rickettsia pox because it resembles chicken pox because the rashes are vesicular okay and another one difference is that it is transmitted by mite and now tick and mite no they how do they transmit they transmit by biting okay so you have to know this another very important thing no is this scrc rashes as i told you no please remember this typhus group and then scrub typhus how many rashes 80% of the people they develop rashes except for the palms and the souls in case of epidemic and bilgence in endemic typhus 80% of the people they have it on the trunk okay in scrub typhus group also rashes are there okay scar is another thing which is a kind of a black color black color uh, you know uh, scab which is present at the site of bite wherever no that's why this bite is wherever these ticks and mites are responsible where they bite the humans so at that area we can find a a scar which is characterized by the presence of a black colored crust like material surrounded by a erythematous halo okay so it is present in case of scrub typhus in 35% of the cases in case of rocky mountain spotted fever group very less but however see you can see this no rickettsia pox and african tick fever virus 90% of cases a scar is there so always whenever you see any person coming with any history and our area is quite uh, famous for you know scrub typhus we have a lot of cases from meghalaya which is reported for scrub typhus so we need to know that okay so and then the another test the most commonly used test for diagnosis of this rickettsia fever is your will felix test okay so in will felix test basically we are trying to develop the antibodies to the different antigens of rickettsia okay so the antigens of rickettsia are ox19 ox2 oxk okay so ox19 if it is coming out to be positive then ox2 may be positive negative it may be either your epidemic typhus or endemic typhus okay because both are same but if in case of scrub typhus only oxk is the one which comes out to be positive and in spotted fever group both your ox19 and ox2 should be there we do this test even in our institute very regularly it is a very easy test it is a kind of a latex agglutination test where we use you know this is has got a antigenic mimicry okay molecular mimicry is there means it is these antigens are present normally in the rickettsia okay these are belonging to the auto membrane protein antigens and they have got a similarity with the proteus bacteria okay the lipopolysaccharide layer in the gram negative cell wall of proteus they have similarity with this so from there we develop these antigens and we test for the antibody in human so if it comes out antibody to x19 and 2 is there then it can be any of these spotted fever group except rickettsia pox caused by rickettsia acari which is in which case all are negative okay and in brill jensa disease also it is negative or very weakly positive so please remember all this okay so broadly divided into this typhus and spotted fever group okay as i told you it is uh, got a gram negative cell wall so the more important component of it is the outer membrane protein which is 
it may be OMP A or OMP B. OMP A is present only in the spotted fever group. OMP B is present in both the typhus as well as the spotted fever group. Then you have the group specific alkali stable lipopolysaccharide antigen. Okay, now this lipopolysaccharide antigen is the one which is the basis for Will Felix test. Okay, so this it is found in some rickettsia and shared by certain strains of proteus. So from the proteus, we do not take from rickettsia, from the proteus we take, okay, because it exhibits this molecular mimicry. So we take, develop these antigens from proteus. It comes in, for us, we just need to buy the reagents and then we look for the antibodies against these antigens. And then we can interpret accordingly according to these which are here. Okay, so this is the basis for Will Felix test. So as I told you, the transmission tick mite is by biting, louse fleas by auto inoculation by rubbing or scratching of the abbreviated skin or mucosa contaminated by insect feces. Okay, so trans ovarian transmission may also occur. Like in tick and mite, no, they can if they are infected, they can through the ovum, they can also pass down into the in, uh, in the, into the eggs and into the progenies. Okay, so that is the way. So how does it spread? After the bite from the skin, it is taken into the lymphatics. Lymphatics from the lymphatics, it goes to the regional lymph nodes and it multiplies there. Okay, so there you have lymphadenopathy, and from there it enters again into the blood stream. So that target sites are endothelial cells, basically the endothelial cells. So that's why those rashes occur because it affects the endothelial cells, the capillaries. That's why those rashes, hemorrhagic rashes, they occur because it can cause plugging, it can cause ischemia, it can cause necrosis, finally resulting in hemorrhagic rashes. Okay, so phagocytosis, okay, addition to the endothelial cells using OMP, A and B, and which results in phagocytosis, intracellular location, all these things I have already told you, okay. So please just go through this, okay, that chart is very important, if you know the chart, most of the things will be clear, okay, so these things I have just told you, okay, because endothelial cell injury occurs because of the lipid peroxidation of the host cell membrane, it's very less, it's given point wise, just you can make a small note on it, Okay, you may get a long question on this, you may get a short note also on it. Okay, so Will Felix test is kind of heterophile agglutination test. Why heterophile? Because as I told you, know, that cell wall, that lipopolysaccharide layer of the proteus, some strains of proteus, gram-negative cell wall, and the rickettsia gram-negative cell wall, they have antigenic similarity. Okay, so that's why it is kind of a heterophile agglutination test because we are not using directly the rickettsia lipopolysaccharide, but we are using the those specific strains of proteus which has got antigenic similarity with the uh, your rickettsial lipopolysaccharide layer. Okay, so basically we detect the antibodies which are detected against proteus antigens. Okay, so tube agglutination test is the one which we do. So I have told you all this. Okay, the titus if it is less than one, more than one is to 80, we consider it to be a possible infection. Okay, so false positive may occur in case of proteus infection, definitely because you're using the antigens which are similar to, to proteus, proteus bacteria. Okay, gram-negative cell wall, lipopolysaccharide layer of gram-negative bacteria. So, false positivity can occur if the patient is already suffering from proteus infection. Okay, so false negative also can occur because if it may exhibit the phenomenon, prozone phenomenon. Okay, so prozone, you know, no, that antigen antibody, if they are present in equal concentration, only then agglutination is seen. If any of these is high or low, uh, post-zone phenomenon or prozone, if it is there, then in that case, it may not show the agglutination that may result in false negative. So that is obviated by doing serial dilution so that at a particular dilution, at least the antigen antibody will be similar. Okay, so this indirect immunofluorescence assay is another assay. Okay, so this is called, this is the gold standard. Okay, any titers of more than 1 is to 64 is considered to be significant. However, sensitivity, specificity, all are good, but it is very cumbersome. So it is not used, in practically it is not used so much. Okay, though it is the gold standard. These days what we use are more specific, uh, the, the test which is more better than Will Felix is the ELISA test which we are using quite often. Okay, uh, and then the others like indirect immunoperoxidase assay or ICT tests. Okay, all these things are there. Isolation is basically you can, in this case also you have to use cell lines, all these things as I told you earlier. Molecular tests are there. The drug of choice for this is doxycycl doxycycline. Alternatives you can give chloramphenicol. Prevention of rickettsiosis, how can you do? You can actually first control the vectors and then only it will be possible to control the infection. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Both the topics are important. Okay. Please take these slides, yes, make small notes. Okay. The charts which are there, no? These chart, if you remember the chart, no? The rest of the thing will fall into place. Okay. This one. For rickettsia, if you remember this whole chart, rest you can make up and write. Okay, so read this chart, just make this chart and keep reading, keep reading, keep reading, keep reading.
okay malaria is also very important these two has got a very high chance that it might come for you okay in any of your exams so malaria to very high chance even rickettsia is a important topic and uh, scrub typhus in meghalaya we are getting a lot of cases so please read it okay you don't need to read separately you, if you read this whole chart generally it is enough okay then thank you okay thank, thank you, you sir, sir thank you sir bye 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 bye